Hello, I'm Vivian. I'm a curator at the Vitre Design Museum. And um, today is one of our Instagram live talks, which we do every couple of weeks now. And I'll be speaking to someone I've been looking forward to speaking to for a while. Her name is Jane Hall. She's a member of a group called Assemble, which you should be familiar with, I'm assuming. It's a multidisciplinary design collective based in London. They do architecture, um, design, exhibition design, too many things to mention really, and um, many things don't really fit into a category. Uh, but Jane also um, does her own research, and I'll be speaking mostly about her own research with her, which is um, at the moment a lot about women in design, and coincidentally, we at the Vitra Design Museum are interested in women in design as well. And um, so we got to speak to each other and we thought we make one of those talks public. And here is Jane already. <laughs> Hello, Jane. Hi. Okay. <laughs> Very good to meet you. So um, I was just introducing you and and um, also the work that you've been doing. And um, I've got your book here, which I'll be showing in a minute. And I'm sure yeah. you've got copies as well. Um, but uh, before we get stuck into your own research, are you okay? Uh, yeah, just trying to plug in another light because I feel like I'm very... No, you're yeah, actually fine, I think. Grey and you look all uh, much warmer. Um, give me two seconds. That oh, makes like, zero difference. No, anyway. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm really curious about um, how you sort of... Um, marry your own work with the work of Assemble, right? Because I, I just just before we started speaking, I had a look at the Assemble website again. I realized you are so prolific. There's so much work being done. And do most of the members sort of have their own work as well that they bring into the practice? Or how do you kind of do the research and the teaching and all the things you do together with Assemble? Uh, yeah, loads of, well, I mean, I suppose Assemble is always had its roots in a kind of very exploratory, interdisciplinary approach. Um, so not everyone in Assemble has an architecture background. Not everyone in Assemble has a design background. Um, and so um, lots of people have very specific interests. I think what brings us together is a sort of joy of making things, um, that really kind of tactile material, uh, kind of hands-on approach. Um, and so lots of different members teach. Most people have taught at some point, something. Um, and we kind of all, we see it all as assemble work. So it's quite a broad umbrella, really. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. so that means that a, a sort of you, you always jump back and forth between, you teach at the AA, right? I teach at the Royal College of Art. Um, right. There are three members of assemble who do teach at the AA as well um and at a couple of other places we've currently got a unit in uh epfl uh right. Lausanne, and one at um the bartlett school of architecture in london as well okay so how many of you are there all together um <laughs> yeah it depends what method of counting you use right um, like kind of 15 uh members core members but we have um other employees who we count very much as kind of part of the assemble family so there are there are kind of seven additional employees um, right so yeah okay. oh well that, <laughs> that at least gives me an idea so but we um got together today to speak about all the research you've been doing um which i think kind of started and but you'll have to correct me there into women in design and i think it started with your phd right um, yeah, a little bit. I, I wrote my PhD um, on the Brazilian architect Lina Bobardi um, and her kind of British counterpart, <clears throat> although it's unclear whether they knew each other, um, Alison and Peter Smithson. So really looking into the lives of two very significant women designers at the kind of post-war period. Um, and so whilst my focus, and I didn't particularly pick up on a kind of really gendered angle, um, mm -hmm. I very much was dealing with the work and biographies of two two women um, in a very gendered climate. Uh, so, um, yeah, that put me on the path to, you know, talking to lots of interesting people um, about about other women architects and designers. So um, you, wrote a, you wrote a book um, called Breaking Ground, so I'll just... Yeah. 
but uh, yeah. we can have matching matching colors the screen with red and <laughs> orange <laughs> um and um which came out last year right no, it's uh, uh, 20 2019 yeah yeah and um and it it uh, profiles or it sort of shows on one page how many female architects right um I think there are 150 architects, um, but more, I think there are 180 buildings or something, because sometimes there's two things for a designer and it's really tracing or trying to capture in one place um, the work of women architects globally from 1900 to the present day right. uh, in a really simple format. So, so Fide and the publishers sort of describe it as a visual survey. Uh, <laughs> and so it's really focused on, on buildings, on architecture with a capital A, uh, <laughs> and sort of inserting women it, it back into the canon or emphasizing their presence. <laughs> yeah, okay, so yeah, my next question was like, what prompted you? I, I suppose it was an organic process, probably. You were writing on two women, you didn't, as you say, take a gendered approach, but it probably sort of got you thinking about women, right? And then this book came out of it, or? Um, no, not really, actually. It, it, it was really an invitation from the publishers. They had the concept of wanting to book, do a book that really um, uh, brought to light uh, or centred uh, women architects. And um, I got to know some of the editors at Fiden uh, through my work on Brazilian modernism. Um, they'd just done a book about brutalism. Um, and so I had talk to them about brutalism that's happening in South America um, and started talking to them about Lena Bobardi um, and so they invited me to kind of in a way take their early idea about doing a book about women and architecture and really shaping that project and developing it and thinking with them about what that might kind of mean um, yeah and I'm, I'm really interested to hear a little bit more about it, just because we also do a sort of a similar direction, as you say, like researching women in design is, and I'll get to it a little bit later, quite a difficult thing to do, I feel, because you don't necessarily want to take the gendered approach. You don't want to talk about them as, you know, as, as someone of a particular gender. You just want to sort of find personalities who did interesting work who've perhaps been overlooked so how did you approach that task or what what what, what did your mind sort of shift over the time yeah i so i really was kind of a bit like i don't i don't i don't think the world needs this book <laughs> this yes. book will do more damage um and then i you know off the top of my head i tried to list how many women architects i could name and i got to about 40 and really struggled and then started doing a little bit of research and just found amazing work that you only find if you do you know like a really gendered google search and usually um you know lots of people are partnered with or you know very famed male architects or or in you know these kind of practices um with mixed kind of gendered architects um and just realized that uh there's specific especially historically um, in the kind of mid 20th century. So many women architects deserve way more kind of credit, praise. They were there participating as well, you know, at a time when architecture was also really a theoretical um, pastime. They were there at those kind of big conferences and meetings and shaping in a way, um, uh, you know, kind of modernity. And um, we don't hear about them. And there's a reason for that. So um, I got really engaged with the project just from finding, I think in my working research, I have over 800 designers. So this is really a really tiny proportion of, of you know, what I'm always adding, always hearing, you know, I'm coming at it from a very, you know, <laughs> like white British perspective. Um, so whilst it is global, I think there's a lot to be added from from other authors and across the rest of the world. Um, but also realizing how much one's gender plays into your career in a way, or how you are received and how women's experiences um, don't necessarily play into say like <laughs> specific design tropes, 
but is a very specific experience, which is also multi-layered and within itself multiplicitous. Um, and that actually, you know, and I know not all women architects would feel the same way. And we capture a lot of them in the book who, who don't actually, but I think it's actually very important to be able to say, I am a woman architect, because that means something. Um, uh, yeah, and I could talk <laughs> forever about about that but that, that that was the thing that really drove me to feel like this was a project really worth kind of taking on and pushing as far as possible mm. and and it's interesting because in your book you actually do quote daughter mandrip who says i'm not a female architect i am an architect and we've researched for probably about six months more into design rather than architecture we do in a way constantly encounter architecture and especially urban design as well because there's very many interesting um, female voices there. I wouldn't necessarily say um, designers or practitioners, but sort of voices who've contributed to how design was made in the end. But I do find that this quote of Dr. Mandrips really um, also encapsulates something that we encounter a lot, which is for a long time, there's been this segregation, this sort of separate spheres theory. Women live in a different world and so I also understand that many architects and designers have for decades actually tried to make a point of saying I am not a female architect I'm an architect I want to be seen just just as everybody else um, and so I'm sure that that is why also I felt kind of a little bit hesitant engaging in a project like that because it's like well <laughs> do we kind of want to continue that segregation and sort of you point things out by their gender but how did you feel about that yeah um i you know i think that everyone has the right to self-identification and if that's the way you know someone wants to define themselves that's that's great um i suppose for me there are kind of really two things there one is that um it represents an ideal it represents a, a future we're trying to work towards and i think actually my research has led me to really believe that it's paralyzing in the present to continue to, um, I suppose, just sort of deny the fact that history and the gender condition in which we work associates being an architect implicitly with being male. Mm. And by saying, I am a woman architect, here are women architects, you're literally just like, you know, telling people um, that it's that's possible and it and it and it exists and and I think the misconception potentially um, I read into it because I found it mainly with architects and not with women designers from products and furniture who mostly do have an architecture background actually mm. um, so like a, a lot of people come from an architecture background in design um, it's architects who think it undermines their professionalism and I think that just really that denial of gender plays into I think this idea that women aren't professional in the way that men are. Um, and then the second thing really is that I think that the ability to deny the effects of gender is very kind of privileged Northern European position to be talking from. Um, and weirdly, actually, I've read some interesting interviews with the architect Yasmin Larry from Pakistan, first female Pakistani architect. Um, and her kind of thing about not wanting to be seen as a woman architect, um, if I'm sort of interpreting what she says in, in her interview correctly, is um, that because it's such a middle class profession, where as it is in a lot of the world, but in, in Pakistan, women, designing for women, being a woman is associated implicitly with a, a lower class way of being in society. And so, so it just doesn't fit because she identifies as an architect first with her kind of understanding of the sort of cultural practices which she's engaging with and the way society in Pakistan is um, structured. So, you know, you've got two women from two completely different parts of the world kind of saying the same thing, but for very different reasons. Mm. Um, and I think it's also a generational thing. I think, you know, um, it's not just women, right? Like this category could be blown open and explored in many more interesting ways. So, um, uh, yeah, I feel very comfortable and positive about and proud to say, you know, I'm a women, woman architect and designer. Um, and here are 150 others <laughs> who, are going, who are only going to get recognition by being brought together in a volume like this. So mm. I hope it supports 
Dortmund Drop's kind of desire to not be um, seen as a woman and architects not to be seen primarily through their gender. But I think identities are complex and multiple and one doesn't negate the other for me. No, for sure. Um, so w one thing you touched on just then is you, um, you find that this is, um, I know that uh, you've recently extended your research also so, um, into looking at women in design, um, or you're also quite familiar with, um, with women designers. And you also just said that in design, you don't find it. Um, design, women d in design um, identify differently. That was interesting. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I've um, spoken to a lot of kind of women designers over the last kind of six months to a year. Um, and uh, I just found an extraordinary number who come from an architectural background and training um, and no hesitancy <laughs> with being labeled a woman. Um, I think there's something in design that is much more in a way legitimized um, uh, through a sort of artistic lens and expression. And so often, actually, I think gender plays into and is more conscious in a lot of practice um, of women. Um, and that's speaking much more about kind of contemporary, you know, women practicing today. Um, historically, it feels like, um, you know, the home has been a very contested space in the post-war period, even from, you know, uh, Marguerite Shulotsky's, I know I butcher her name, <laughs> her Frankfurt kitchen. Um, you know, it wasn't this kind of radical feminist thing. It still put the woman in the kitchen. But, um, you know, the kitchen became this sort of radical site um, for design. And so women, um, you know, have always, I think, found a home in thinking about interiors and in thinking about design in a spatial way. Um, and so I think a less maybe from what I've found from talking to people, um, less tension around around gender um, mm -hmm. in their role as the designer. Mm -hmm. And can I ask you um, uh, something? I've got a couple more questions. You said you had 800 people on your kind of long list, 800. Yeah. <laughs> how, how do you go about finding them? I, uh, you probably <laughs> did tell me that you're an amazing researcher and I believe it, but that's a very long list. And also globally, I'm assuming you didn't travel the globe to find all these practitioners. <laughs> But did you just speak to people or how did you how did yeah you... um i think uh having done a phd on architectural history you become very uh kind of <laughs> maybe developed some slightly worrying addictions to archives mm -hmm. um but you know i found and i think this applies to the most exciting things about research um is how much you learn from speaking to people um so i've you know benefited a lot from some really great connections through the british council um from when i did a fellowship about lena bobardi in brazil seven eight years ago now um and you know through assemble a lot of us have um traveled and worked all around the world and have some really great kind of connections so primarily um, it's like chasing those anecdotes, chasing those rumors that people put in front of you and then trying to follow it up through, you know, more kind of conventional forms of media. Um, but yeah. a, a follow-up question on that, though, which is what we are also finding, like sometimes you, you know, you find the archive, you find a person that was previously, pre previously perhaps not so much overlooked, but not so much was known about them. You know, one thing may have been known about them, but then you you find a lot more but often in archives through talking to people maybe you see you meet the families of you know if the designers have passed away you, you might be able to meet their family or something but on the other hand it's sometimes really difficult like some people are just there is no information on them also what we found with a lot of women designers sort of you know 7200 years ago is they often had quite meandering uh, biographies they might have sort of started out in design but then perhaps they went into teaching or they mm -hmm. changed their names through marriage and so it's very difficult to trace people so in a way we've also got this ambition to <clears throat> really you know not 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 revise history but just sort of add to it like add mm -hmm. another but it's 
quite hard because often these things aren't preserved so well, right? Or not at yeah. at all just documented as, you know, it's also really hard to kind of just decipher um, if there was a partnership, which there often was, either professional or, you know, a, 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 a marriage, then um, it's just really hard to work out who did what and who was involved in which way. And you, you kind of can't anyway. Oh, so. uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm probably... Um this probably wouldn't go down well with people who are super fastidious about about facts but I was quite loose with crediting <laughs> you know if a woman was mentioned in relation to a famous work or a famous building or a famous architect then you know I dig as far as I could but not get too caught up on you know like where they landed in a project and I think as I say in the introduction you know so much goes into producing architecture that isn't limited to the person who the, the what we would call now the project architect um you know i think i've got um elizabeth bomb mm -hmm. um and i know she worked in ernst bomb's studio but you know she brought up his four kids who became architects three of whom became architects she was definitely um doing interiors um but we have her in for one of his buildings so you know it's quite a loose interpretation of credit for her i would say one of the more looser ones but um she's very much played a significant role in the production of that architecture and trying to really break free from this idea that architecture is purely produced through some sort of singular genius um and that there's the whole back end of architectural production um that keeps the whole machine going and and enables people um to produce something and often you know lots of these works um, take years sometimes decades to produce and I think it would be naive to assume that you could ever singly attribute something or that even that would be like worth doing um, mm -hmm. the one that they wouldn't let me go for which I must just actually check is that they wouldn't let me say that Jane Drew had done Chandigarh <laughs> can't touch Le Corbusier apparently um, <laughs> but I got I got a uh, Lily Rykin for the um, Barcelona Pavilion so that felt like a bit of a win <laughs> yeah I did uh, I did notice that in your in your essay as well but talking the calling it a back end of architecture and design is really interesting because um, what we are also finding is that in our research as I said like we're mostly focusing on design and furniture design and women in design but uh, but we do inevitably always because especially you know 50 years ago everyone who was in furniture was an architect all the italian designers yeah. architects but um but also what we are finding is that there is this you know i will steal that expression from you back end i think because there is this whole production site for architecture that is completely into design that is completely um, not necessarily part of our history because we're so focused on the artifact or the building. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We found, for instance, that there is a lady called Ellen Swallow Richards. She was the first um, chemistry student at MIT in the late 19th century. And she, in, she invented home economics because she wasn't really allowed to practice chemistry at M MIT. Mm -hmm. So she moved into this female sphere, the home, and really um, sort of started to which at the time was really a kind of a prevalent theme, looking into hygiene and hygienic conditions. But Paul Nortout, when he designed all his um, uh, modernist kind of uh, housing estates in Berlin that were based on all these principles of hygiene and air and light, actually referred to her quite early on in his book saying, you know, all my all my buildings are based on her findings. And um, so that was nice that he gave her that credit. Um, in the same book, he also um, made some statements that, you know, that weren't so friendly towards women. But <laughs> but uh, I, we do find that there is all these sort of practitioners, and especially at a time where women weren't so welcome at universities, like 100 years ago, or didn't have the chance to go, that that have made a massive contribution to architecture and design, but it wouldn't have necessarily been building something or mm -hmm. design mm -hmm. works, but rather often they were writing, they were advocating, they were 
um, sort of uh, somehow implicated in social work or commenting on urban design. So it's interesting how to kind of deal with that when we write history in such a way, or even today, it's all based on the kind of author of a work. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that in your research and your books? Um, so Breaking Ground, um, I suppose the elephant in the room is that it really centers the architectural building. And what's mm. quite interesting, um, uh, you know, that's very much about kind of, I suppose, the interpretation, the obvious interpretation is it's a sort of like masculine reading of architecture and where men have always managed to excel that kind of construction um, and manifestation um, of architecture. Um, and so there's, both, there's two things going on here. One is that I think um, what this particular volume does really well is say women have always done that too. And so hi the historiography may say that architecture is built by men. Actually, <laughs> when you look a little deeper, um, you realize that like architecture of a capital A has a history of women. So we could recenter maybe um, and include it as something that women have been part of. Um, that said, that doesn't do much to then expand what architecture is, which as you say, many women out of necessity um, as well in many ways have been drawn to um, you know, university environments where there's greater flexibility, um, research, activism, um, or in you know, like the sort of <laughs> godmother of all architecture, Phyllis Lambert, who runs the Canadian Centre for Architecture. You know, there's no Sea Grand building without Phyllis Lambert, the kind of greatest commissioner there's ever been. Um, and so the book has at the back a kind of it, it, it's really a bibliography so it's 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 people who are referenced uh in the introduction or who um uh, facilitated the research or kind of were really um formative for it at the back there's a kind of um uh further reading <laughs> uh which is mini biographies of exactly the type of people who mm. talk about and you know in the UK people like Matrix Design Cooperative um, were really important lots of thinkers academics um, you know you have like Ada Louise Huxtable who's like one of mm. the most amazing critics of all time um, and uh, yeah both past and present and it's just a, I mean it is really it's like a kind of embarrassingly tiny fraction <laughs> yeah. of everyone um, but I think, you know, we have to not try and, in this work, not try and put all eggs in one basket and that yeah. we need loads of projects that can attack everything at different angles. Um, mm. And so, um, yeah, I, I think it's like, you know, shining a light on, <laughs> on everyone. Yeah, for sure. So shining a light, I, we, we, we're coming to the end of our talk, but I just want to ask you one thing to to end with who was a you said when you first counted um you you knew 40 female architects now you've got a then you researched 800 and 150 ended up in your book there was someone you were really surprised by in terms of you know not knowing them to begin with and then understanding oh my god <laughs> um i don't know it's so hard to think off the top of my head now god there's so many so many amazing people. The, 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 the person who I'm really kind of sad that didn't make the cut um, for reasons oh, I'm entirely clear on is Anne Ting, who mm -hmm. worked with Louis Kahn for 28 years, um, you know, was the sort of mother of his child. There's an amazing um, documentary from about 15 years ago called My Architect by his son. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, and, and Anne Ting you know she in a way like inspired a lot of the sort of um world of archigram um she had a very kind of like weird take on uh based on nature she had this like phd about fibonacci and architecture um and a lot of some of you know she she facilitated a lot of louis khan's um work and she's actually potentially one person that maybe quite a lot of people people know about but she was you know, one of those people who was in my sort of tangential, <laughs> sort of like peripheral vision <laughs> when I began the research. And I thought, well, if there are more Antings, then we're onto a, a good thing here. Um, so yeah, you know, there's, 
Oh, there's so many amazing more. Oh, I'm just sort of flicking through now. Um, loads of people I also just want to know more about um, as well. And I think there's, um, you know, parts of the world. I've done a lot of stuff in Brazil because of connections in Brazil and just some really exciting young practitioners who are coming from there, like Carla, Drasaba. Um, and so I think it's, um, yeah, a really good time okay in design great i won't you put you on the spot any longer <laughs> i'm gonna go back and read my whole book now <laughs> um well thank you so much for your time today and i'm looking forward to speaking to you further um yeah. about all of our projects yeah yeah thank you so much it's been a pleasure great. thank you so great. much <laughs>